All right, welcome back to your balance diet of teletainment. Now, time for us to play you this interview where we I beget when with Chilean Azu, um, a Libyan returnee for Inter Webodo, Nigeria. Now, she's not a person where her auntie be tell her, say, why you they suffer yourself for Nigeria? Come abroad and then uh, you life go better for you. Even though say she be no one go, um, later she can't decide, say, okay, with so much pressure, may she actually go this Webodo abroad. But she be not know, say, the journey where they are ahead. Not be the journey where it goes sweet you at all. She will share her experience and her story with us um, just recently. Enjoy this particular interview we will be get with Chilean Azu. Thanks, Abon, say you want to share your story with us. Now, before we go into when you enter Libya, let me know more about you. Tell us about your background, your growing up days, and even your school days. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Azu Ifi Chilean. I'll be return migrant from Libya. Okay, my growing up days, um, I come from a family of five, my mom, my dad, and then two other siblings. And um, growing up was actually awesome until about 2010 when we had certain family issues and that was when I got admission into the university. So it was like a struggle, a huge struggle for me because my dad could no longer afford to pay some of our bills. And then, um, but uh, in my first year, it was a bit easy because the school fee was less, it was about 72,000 plus. So when I got to second year, it became increased. Actually, um, I schooled at Ingo State University of Science and Technology. So in my second year, it became 102,000. And then by then we could no longer afford the bills. And then I also had a responsibility to take care of my younger ones. So I had to take the um, youngest among us to join me in Enugu because I actually wanted her to come out best. So she joined me, I sacrificed almost everything I, I had with me then to get an apartment, put her in school and all of that so I could no longer pay my fees for that section. Um, I had to carry it over to the next section where I took my exams but I never knew it wasn't recorded. You know, I took the exams without exam number so I got information that it would be recorded so when I pay the school fee, I can get my results, but I never knew it wasn't recorded. So um, we carried on till my finals. So it was now, I was paying the school fee, each school fee a year after. So I had to rush up, pay the finals and the third year at the same time. So um, after everything, I got to discover that I had huge outstanding results. <laughs> it was hell for me. At what point? In my finals. The, uh, the department, because I studied architecture, they said I couldn't take my project. I did everything I could, pleaded if I could be give, granted um, the privilege to take my project and then I would write the outstandings, but it was not given. So um, in, out of frustration, I had to just pack up and leave school and then by then, my younger sister was able to take her uh, SSC, so I was glad that she at least took her SSC. So I went back home. We did everything two years after, because as of 2014, we did everything two years after 2014, that's to 2016, to see if I could retrieve the results, but to no avail. So that was childhood for me. Wow, amazing. So now, I, I don't say you have a beautiful son. At what point in this struggle, you beget your picking. Tell us a little bit about the story. Okay, so um, when I go back um, village, I be stay with my dad, but me, I can't notice say, to stay with my dad, you know, go let me work because my dad na teacher. Na person when he be say, education day top for him. So I reason him say, you know what make I work on my own, train myself. He, he still believe saying go see if he do something, but I know they see him. Uh, as in, as if say the dream go feel come true. So I come, come up from there, move, go where my mom stayed, uh, where my mom they stayed that time. 
I started a business with my mom. Okay, so we were selling food somewhere with um, one oil company, and then after a while, the company folded. So, being someone who has a little experience from school, I decided to start teaching you know, because it was a village, and then I was able to put little money together. It was then I met my baby's dad and he was like you know you have skills you have you're good you're this and that you can actually do something nice for yourself if you leave this village so he added money to what i already had and i had to get an apartment in town so the relationship started and um though not in my mom's absence because i made my mom know see someone who is actually interested in me so my mom was actually in support but we never knew it was calm <laughs> so um uh, I started teaching in that particular town. I taught for about a month and, and then I discovered that I was pregnant. Though I didn't really know I was terribly sick. Like, I was losing weight and looking horrible. So we didn't really know what was happening to me before my mom said, okay, we have to go over to my dad's side so that I can meet the family doctor and know what was wrong with me. So uh, it was then we discovered I was pregnant. So when we called him and told him I was pregnant, he said, um, he is not ready. So my dad is already involved and I can't tell my dad I want to do anything silly. So I told him my parents won't allow me to do anything like that. So he was like, he has told me to flush it. There's nothing else he wants to hear. So my parents tried inviting him over, talking to him, you know, this thing has happened. What do you think? And he was like, there's nothing he can do for now. So we had to let go. The struggle started. My dad said, okay, to protect me more, he doesn't want me to stay with my mom anymore. So my mom had to move back to my dad's house. And then we were with my dad together throughout the process till the nine months elapsed. And then I had my son March 20th, 2017. So you had your son in 2017. And that one uh, about the time where you decide say you want to go to Libya. Tell us how that decision take happen. Okay, so um, four months after I had him, that was uh, about May, right? Eight, uh, March, April, May, okay, June. Uh, my cousins called that they needed someone. They needed about four people from the family, three boys, uh, three ladies and a guy so, to come over to Europe. So when they told me initially, I said, I'm not going because I was running exclusive for my son. I just wanted the best for him. So I told them I wasn't coming, except they would allow me to come with him. So they said, no, I can't come with him. It's not something I can actually come with a child. So my mom was like, how can you see this kind of opportunity? Just look at your story, how you started and the point you got to. You just need to forget about I would help you, I'll take care of this child. This child is my child. It's not like, uh, we are not even seeing it like you're the mom. You know what everyone is saying, that, I, that she was telling me she is the mom. So, and my dad is the father of the child. So I have to just let go and travel with my cousins. I initially said, no, 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 my, we argued a little. And my dad wasn't actually in support because he has a little experience. So he was like, you don't have to go now. Uh, let's keep looking out for other things and all of that. But I, at some point, convinced him when one of my aunties stepped in as well. That one explained to me about being uh, a first child and you know the responsibility, the younger ones are coming after you, you have to do a lot and all of that. So at some point I was convinced and I had to convince my dad as well. So he accepted and he was like, okay, since it's like that, he will pray for me and then um, the normal African way, he blessed Kola, prayed for me that whosoever, wherever I find myself, I'll be favored. So that was how I got involved in the journey. So involved in the journey, how you take go? Was it through a passport, a legal passport, or you guys do backyard runs? Okay. Um, by the time when uh, I come up from house, Okay, they told me you have to come over to Benin. So I joined them in Benin and then Benin they told us there is a document and the document um, we'll get it when we get to Abuja. But at the time we got to Abuja we heard the document is in Kano. 
So we joined, we just kept going till we got to Kano. So when they brought the documents, I discovered it was my picture, but it wasn't my name. I asked questions, but there was no good answer, no reasonable answer, and even a threat. So I had to keep quiet. But I discovered it was a Sorry, beginning. Sorry, a threat from who? From one of the connections, the people who were in charge of the passport and all of that. So the guy just told me, uh, you better don't talk now because if you talk too much, we'll lock you up and others will go. So for that not to happen to me, I had to just keep quiet. And then they told me the name, you might get questions from the um, officers, the immigration officers, so you have to have these details in your head. So I had to cram the details. So at what point eh, in all this journey from Benin to Abuja, Abuja to Kano, you realize, say, this will not be what I, I, I be thinking it will be. Okay. Um, initially, the first place where I got scared was at Kogi State. Um, we met some officers. Um, um, I think, I don't really know if they were policemen, but they were different um, officers. So they just made everyone calm down and then they picked a few youths, took us to a particular place and said, not them. So the not them, I didn't really understand it, not them, because I know I don't do anything silly. So I was like, there is nothing in my bag. They were searching. Once they open your bag, they say not them. They will zip the bag and give it to you, you know. So I was like, I didn't do anything. I was trying to defend myself. And then the man said, we know. We know you people, we know. So I was like, asking the man that was with us, what did we do? So the man said, eh, everybody, because they gave us 10,000 10, when we were leaving the house. Okay, everybody, um, yeah, each person, 2,000. Um, he collected the t uh, 2,000 from us and then pleaded with the men that, please, just let us go. We don't have anything in our bags, as you can see, just let us go. So I kept asking, not them, as in, what did, did not them imply? What does it actually mean? So until we got to Kano again, the guy that came to pick us just said, take, take, take. I opened it, so it's a jab. He said, wait. We quickly had to put it on. I was like, why the hijab? What do we need it for? The next thing, um, everybody jumping, jumping. We left. He handed, over, uh, handed us over again to some bike men, and then that was when I discovered that this is not for kids. At this point, why you not call your, pam your fa a father or mother or even your auntie where they advise you? Okay, um, when we left Benin, we didn't live with a phone. It was only the man that was um, with us that had the phone. So there's no way I could make any calls or tell anybody anything that was going on because even he himself was like, uh, there's no um, problem, we are fine. So I was still insisting, but he was saying, that they've already told him that not until we get to a certain point in the journey before we can make a call. So I had no way to reach out to my family. So from Kano, tell us the journey after that. Okay, so from Kano, we left to um, Agades. Also, How was the leaving? With boss, a good boss or what? Not, tell us not, about it. Not a good boss, okay. At, excuse me, at Kano, um, we were put in a bus. After that bike issue, the, I, I was made to sit at the boots because we had, there was a way it was arranged. I, don't, I can't count the number of people in the vehicle, but it's, they filled the vehicle to the brim. To the extent the space left for us were about five, was the boots. So they put, I don't know if it's wood, they lifted it a little and then made us to sit and then locked the boot. So it wasn't actually easy and it was raining that night. It was raining. Um, you know, boots, since it's open, the rain was pouring on us, we were cold. So we got to a certain point, they shouted, police, police, everyone ran out. The driver ran out and left us. And then after a while, they came back with some other vehicles. If they call your connection, the man that was taking us knew the connection. So if they call your connection, join this vehicle. If they call your connection, join this vehicle. So they took us in a particular um, vehicle again. 
that one was worse because we the vehicle was without seats you know so we had to sit i don't even know the way they arranged it just had to they packed everyone and then we left that one took us about two days to get to agades so as at the time we got to agades we spent about two days also waiting for some other people to join us to um, fill the um, vehicle that will be leaving Agades for Libya. So I didn't actually know it was going to be through the desert. It was when everyone was saying, you don't buy gallon. <laughs> God. So people were like, you don't buy gallon. This one would say, you don't buy gallon. What do you need a gallon for? This one said, ah, you need water. This one, ah. So I called the man that was with us. Everyone is talking about water. So he said, water. What do we need the water for? Before he had to call the man that um, was in charge and then told the man, people are buying gallon. Do we also need to buy gallon? So the man said, yes. Then he sold our phone because we had no money left. He sold the phone that was given to him to get the gallon. And then when he got the gallon, he got some other little cakes as well. And then they filled it with water. Well, the next night we left. They were moving us from one building to another, from one building to another until we got to a very big yard. I saw a lot of hillocks packed everywhere. The people came in, a lot of people, they covered themselves. So some of us who didn't have things to cover with, uh, we had to use our clothes to cover ourselves. You know, whatever you see others doing, you didn't really know what it's like, but since they are protecting themselves, maybe there's something. So we had to use our clothes till they um, carried us from that place. But before we left, we were about 30 in my helix. That's 30, you sit and then you open your leg for the next person to sit, something like that. And then for me, I was at the edge, so I was given a wood. So um, we left. The night we got into the desert was also horrible. I, I didn't expect what I saw. I discovered there was this breeze. I don't know what I, I would call it, but it was heaping sand towards our direction. So I, I cried that night. I was like, God, if I wake up and find out that I was already buried, is this how I'm going to end my life? So, uh, but fortunately we woke up and um, though I saw heap but it wasn't that much. And then we just heard higher, higher. I was like, what's going on? Let's brush at least. I said, brush. <laughs> you don't know where you're going to. You're talking about brushing. So jump inside or they would leave you here. Quickly, I had to join the others. So we moved, we continued. And then at some point we were arrested by armed men. It was also a terrible one for me because um, I didn't know what was going on. I don't know the reason why the drivers were running around. It looked as if somewhere we've passed. I discovered we are still back to the same place. So what's going on? It's like I was telling my sister with my language, these people are just turning around though. We are not going, I don't know if it's looking like everything here is the same, but we are just rotating in the same environment. So, uh, the driver got to a certain point and then ran away. Okay, so um, we're like, that place was very hot. So someone died. After a while, the driver came back and drove the vehicle again. So we're trying to, because they don't understand English. What happened? Why did he run and all of that? Um, one of us is already dead and they, what they just did was, they just brought sand, a little covered him and was happening in fact for me I don't talk much the only thing is the expression is tears I was crying God why me why should I find myself in this kind of I was even laying cause some of those my cousins why would they put me in this kind of situation I didn't actually come to complain to them but they're saying they want to help this is no help so I was crying and at some point the driver also started, it was now speed this time. So I was like, 
what's happening before we looked around and then we saw we were surrounded, you know, armed men everywhere with um, these um, armed vehicles and all of that. So the driver jumped out and started running. So we equally joined him. We were running, you know, the desert with thorns. It was just terrible. I was crying at some point. People were still running. I looked behind me. The vehicle was almost very close and they were shooting. So I just, I just had to stand. I said, if they want to kill me, I was saying it, I was just saying it unconsciously. If you want to kill me, just kill me. Let me just die. What is this? I just want to die. Kill me. You know, so the man got to where I was and then said, come. That come to me was maybe come and die or something. So I just went to him and then he said, enter. I entered and then he moved. Where was your cousin at this time? The rest of them, we later met somewhere, so they arrested them as well. So they put us together in a very big vehicle and moved to barracks. And they brought everybody out and they said, um, where are you people going to? So after a while, some said Libya, ah, somewhere like, they go Europe, you know, very uh, unreasonable words against the soldiers and all of that. Just leave us know where they go, where they go and all of that. So one white man came, the man was like, where do you guys think you're going to? Where, where are you going to? The man explained and said, okay, uh, the truth is, you have food in Nigeria, you're safe. Why are you running away? When he said that, I was like, I told my cousin, don't you think this man is saying the truth? She said, if we go back, it's worse because you don't even know what you're going to face. So we felt we are not secure, we are not fine. So when the soldiers went to sleep, we escaped again. We ran away. And then this time we ran into the hands of a trafficker. Okay, so the, that was how I discovered the journey also involved trafficking. The man, the driver that picked us, uh, took us somewhere and then exchanged money and left. Then another driver took us again, and then took us to a particular building. So in that building, I'm telling you in details mm -hmm. everything that mm -hmm. happened. So in that building, um, it was like a family house. So they were Nigerians, they don't understand English, they don't speak English. So I met a particular lady I actually liked in the building. So I sat with her and I was trying to talk to her. I wanted to get some information, like what is happening? So I discovered she too has embarked on the journey before because she did a drawing on the ground. She just brought something and she drew water. But as I said then, I didn't know I was going to see water. She just did water and then she drew a boat. So I was like, what a boat? I was trying to, mm -hmm. what a boat? And then she did her hands like this. She did like this, like she did, as at the time she used this boat, crossed, washed, and after some time came back. So I didn't really understand this whole thing, not until I had gotten to Libya. Okay, so when she explained that, I just told her, thank you. Because she was always bringing food, you know, eat something. I've lost appetite already, so she will force me, eat something. No problem, just eat. You'll be fine. She was trying to encourage me. So I was thinking, asking my cousins, this lady drew something. Do you think we will meet water and all of that? So my cousin was like, Let's not worry ourselves because the more we worry, the more problems we see. Let's just forget about what she was trying to explain. So a um, few days later, the driver came back and then he picked us, got to Nitel, sold us out again. And then we moved, on, we moved on from there. So at some point, there was somewhere they locked us up in Nitel. About three days, four days, we didn't see the driver. I was angry. I told them, okay, this time, I'm done. With food or without food? Without food. This time around, I'm done. Like, I can't go anymore. I want to go out there. Anything these people want to do, let them do. So somebody said, if they catch you again, they will return you to Nigeria. That if they return you, you'll be in cell. 
The guy, he seems to be more experienced. So I, I was like, is it true? He said, yes. I said, I don't even care. So I, as I carried my bag, the others followed me. So we met another driver. And then the driver was like, where are you going to come? You know, it was like they were waiting for passengers. This one said, come, this one said, come, this one. I said, me, I'm not coming again, no. I'm going. The man said, where are you going to? Do you know where you are? I said, me, I'm going. He was trying to explain. I said, I don't want to hear anything. So I was walking till I met a particular policeman. So the man was wearing this police uniform and then he said I should come. Okay, so the man was wearing a police uniform and then he called me, he said, come. So when I went to him, those my um, relations that were with me as well, he said, you, Libya, Libya, good. You, no go Nigeria. I said, no, me, Nigeria, me, no go Libya. So we're arguing. And then the man said, I should not worry that he would take me to where Nigerians are in this place so that I will know that I'm safe. So that got into my head. I was like, if I can see others, I will not know, okay. But at least, what's, why would they lock us up here? So the man said, he summoned one helos. The helos came. They carried us with some other guys. And lo and behold, God. When they got to the building, Nigerians everywhere. What was happening? I even saw a family um, with about um, three kids. Right, no four. Two were already like secondary school, then the other two should be like primary. So um, I was trying to talk to because they were Yorubas. Then the man said it was actually his um, elder brother that told him to come over. There's no point staying in Nigeria anymore. So um, that's the reason why he came back. I started conversing with a lot of people over there, and then. Um, some people were people who don't have food, you know, sleeping with men, ensuring you're fine, trying to do everything to make sure you eat. You know, in fact, it was devastating. All right, that's another story of Chile and Azu. She don't tell us how she take come out from Nigeria, from Kano precisely, enter inside um, the desert, and then come reach inside Libya. Now, more things where she share with us, and we will play the part two of this interview for you, maybe on Thursday, and we will actually play them for you this week. To enjoy more of this, our Ogun Get videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.